Okay, well, seeing as it is our dear William's 450th birthday, and you don't get one of those very often, I thought uh, before I came to the actual subject of what I wanted to present, I would just start with a bit to, just very shortly start with a bit of his life, um, just to put it in context, because uh, he was a... Uh, very active man, but he was also a real man. There's been a lot of myths uh, built up around him. People say he didn't exist. His works were written by the Earl of Southampton, or some people say Francis Bacon, and all this other stuff. None of that's true. And of course, um, that becomes most clear if you actually study his works. So therefore, happy 450th birthday, Phil. Um, so, most people um, that learn Shakespeare in school become to hate him because of the way he's taught. <laughs> uh, with most classical literature, unfortunately, but especially with Shakespeare, because his language seems so removed from that which we use today, um, and for those of you Danish speakers, but also other continental European languages, English, modern English, has obviously flattened out and become um, rather shallow because of uh, globalization and, and all of that. But, um, but Shakespeare was uh, living in a time in, in England which was full of, full of upheaval, um, it was not an e easy life uh, that he l led. Um, this, is, this is a map from some time after uh, his time. But uh, he was born in Stratford-upon-Avon, which is about 92 miles from London. And he traveled back and forth between London all the time and Stratford because his family lived in Stratford the whole time in this house which his family had bought. And, um, and his family never came with him to London. Now, we don't know, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but, um, but just to get a sense, you know, this is a one and a half days journey in those times. And um, every now and again, the plague would break out in London. So they had to shut down the theatres, the theatres were closed, and the company had to go on a tour of England in order to continue to play. Um, here are some pictures people might know that the Globe that Shakespeare built had built with his company. The Globe Theatre was burnt down but reconstructed. And you can see plays there today. Um, apparently it's, it's great. I've only seen recordings. But uh, quite lively. And as you can see, um, people were all around. It was a very, a very um, intimate, very intimate theatre. Um, now the main people that played a role in Shakespeare's life were obviously Queen Elizabeth I, who was queen uh, when he was born. Uh, and she died, um, gosh, I can't actually tell you when he died, I think 1601. Uh, and James of Scotland came to the throne for the first time, also unifying the kingdoms of England and Scotland. Um, Elizabeth was Protestant, James was Catholic, uh, but there were huge amounts of conflicts going on uh, between Protestants and Catholics, each side using excuses to suppress and repress against the others. This was the main conflict of the time, and Shakespeare suffered a lot under this because of censorship. Um, it was more difficult to say what you wanted. And uh, it's not clear, but maybe at a certain point he was even forbidden from writing his plays on history because they were simply too uh, dangerous for the court. Um, uh, he, played at, he played both for Elizabeth. He was an, also an actor. He didn't just... Uh, right and, and uh, for the stage. He was an actor in his own company, of course, which under Queen Elizabeth was the Chamberlain's Men, 
and under James um, was then the king's men, it was the court's own company. Um, and so they played for the court as well as in their own Globe Theatre. Um, this man in the middle is the uh, Earl of Essex, who, um, who uh, was a centre of English life at that time because he uh, led the campaigns to, to quell the rebellion in Ireland. The Irish were always trying to get out of English control, uh, but uh, no military attempt to keep the Irish down worked. And that's why the fighting Irish have such a good <laughs> reputation for that still today. And Essex um, was at, at some certain point led to overthrow Elizabeth herself. Um, and he was then put in the Tower of London and executed at some point. And it plays a role in, um, in illusion in a number of Shakespeare's um, pieces. So at the same time, this Protestant-Catholic conflict led to conflict with Spain. There was always the fear of an invasion of the Spanish Armada. The English destroyed it at some point, but uh, there was always rumor that they might come back. Uh, and in those days, to defend a country, everybody was sent, was conscripted to defend the country. And this also meant everybody working in the field on the farm, you know, had to go and, uh, and muster to defend the country. Uh, and in those times, this often led to, to a lot of hunger. And so people are, are very confused. They have no insight into what happens in court. You know, we try to get insight into what our governments are doing. We have every now and again an Edward Snowden or Lyndon LaRouche that give insight into what's going on behind the scenes, but the people of England at that time have no access to what is controlling their life. And, and the thing that raises Shakespeare up out of his time, and not like the many other poets that are in his time, is that he, he is able to give people a perspective on the history unfolding in their time, such that uh, it's connected to universal ideas, to principles of humanity, of causality, of love, friendship, um, all of the things that in his 154 sonnets, or 150 odd sonnets, um, are dealt with. And, and I think that Shakespeare does that the best of, of any playwright, even, even more so than Schiller, who's my next favorite, simply because uh, there is no veil between you and your insight into what the characters are doing. And so um, this, this, primary, um, this primary effect of the stage on the people of England at that time is very strong, that, that people are able to lift up, get lifted out of their daily lives and take part in the actions of princes and kings um, and that really is quite, a, quite an amazing thing, really. I mean, it's something that we miss in our time, uh, in a certain sense. Um, so I'm really glad that we started with music, actually, because it's always rather strange talking about classical art, because classical art needs to be done, it needs to be practiced. Uh, so <laughs> we'll, I'll have some excerpts that I want to play for you a little bit later on. But um, it was the German poet Friedrich Schiller that after Mendelssohn and Lessing really theoretically worked out as a playwright himself what it was that Shakespeare accomplished with drama, with theater. What role does it play in society? And this is a deep question. This is, we are so, we have such a problem today with our one can really say we are culturally in a dark age. Uh, we, uh, everything, theater, music, everything has been degraded to entertainment. And even classical music, classical theater has become one part of a circus to entertain us, to get by the time, to somehow ignore and make the rest of life, which isn't so enjoyable, somehow a little sweeter. 
And that degrades art in the utmost because actually Schiller's uh, whole, yeah, basically his life's mission was to establish art as the, actually the most important, and the artist is the most important servant of society. That the, the artist does something which nobody else can do and which is incredibly essential. Um, and his piece um, on the, uh, the theatre as a moral institution, which I think gives good insight into what Shakespeare's accomplishment was, uh, deals with that on, on a certain scale, where he actually was invited to speak to, um, to the part of the court of Baden-Württemberg at that time. Um, and he was obviously able to lift this onto a higher level when he exchanged letters with uh, the Danish prince, uh, Augustenburg, on um, the aesthetical education of man, uh, where he took these ideas a step further. And there was a, obviously a large following in Denmark um, at that time. And so the thing that's really quite amazing with with any great poet, and Shakespeare's, one of, again, one of the best examples, is that there is no, when they are, when you call them popular, it's because they affect everyone. If you think about art today, it's either mass effect, like big rock and pop events, or it's art for art's sake, right, where, uh, you know, music, theater are pushed to such extremes, everybody's trying to do it out each other doing something new, but the general populace has no, cannot follow. It's not for them. It doesn't touch them, it doesn't move them, it doesn't deal with anything universal. It's actually more centrally based than it is idea based. Um, and uh, that's why there's a disconnect between the avant-garde of what calls themselves the avant-garde of art today and the rest of the population because it just does not have um, the kind of content and the kind of form, for example, that Shakespeare gave. And Shakespeare was literally uh, a revolutionary in what he did, but yet his interest was that of to, to bring mankind forward. And the best artists had that at, at heart that they were there serving people in some sense. And even if it is not conscious, if, you, if you're if you really true to a, to a deeper idea of humanity, that you, I'm totally convinced that it's a, there's a basic motivation that says, okay, people as I see now are living beneath their dignity. Their inborn dignity, and this is something that moved Schiller his whole life, their inborn dignity is higher and therefore, we must strive to attain something higher. Um, and there's, there's a great piece on this, um, which Schiller wrote. Uh, I don't think it exists in English. It's called Über Bürgers Gedichte, where there's a great poet called uh, Bürger who wrote poems, and uh, Schiller wrote an anonymous critique of them and made clear that, okay, but if you want to be popular, then you need to fulfill you need to be popular to everyone because you need to be universal and not just entertain people. Um, Schiller was obviously a great follower of Shakespeare um, and translated Macbeth in 1800. Um, Lessing, before him, had translated Macbeth for Germans. And even before any of his works was, were in German, a lot of companies toured Germany and was, was very popular. Um, and there's one quote from Schiller's Theatre as a Moral Institution, which gets really to the heart of this question, where he says, um, the statesman that wants to lift up theatre to a, to a level where it can move and educate people, uh, lets all previous generations pass in review, weighing nation against nation, century against century, and finds how slavishly the great majority of the people are ever languishing in the chains of prejudice and opinion, 
which eternally foil their strivings for happiness. He finds that the pure radiance of truth illumines only a few isolated minds who probably had to purchase that small gain at the cost of a lifetime's labors. By what means then can the wise legislator induce the entire nation to share in its benefits? This is the question that he poses, and that's what we see. Most people, and it's a, something that we have to, every generation has to see how can we break this. Why is it that only so, f that a handful of people in the human history bring us forward, make new insights, make new breakthroughs? And how do we, and how do, how does, how do we um, make these breakthroughs available to the general populace? So starting from this question, theater, as Schiller sees it and as Shakespeare lived it, has several things that it, that it, that it uniquely does. Um, it extends, uh, it acts in the support of moral law, right? It, uh, you have plays like, well, all of Shakespeare's plays or tragedies, great crimes, that are brought to stage, and a sense of justice um, can be can be enacted um, by people seeing uh, what horror people can commit, and gives some insight into how it's done. Schiller gives the example of um, of Macbeth, which is probably the most gruesome of all crimes, and how. <coughs> Both Lady Macbeth and uh, Macbeth himself are driven insane by becoming conscious of what they've done. And he takes the quote where Lady Macbeth says, here's the, here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. So she can smell the blood that she has on her hands for killing for killing Duncan, the King of Scotland. Um, but, but, but that's just acting as, a, as an extension of what sort of the courts see as law. But beyond that, there are, there are crimes and there is, there's crimes which go as unpunished, but there's virtue which goes unsung. People do bad things with, and they get away with it in their lifetime. We don't hear about it. There's also people that do great things in, in their lifetime, but they are not recognized. And so the theater can also bring these onto the stage and give, let these um, play their hand. Uh, and Schiller cites King Lear for this, because King Lear obviously is betrayed by his daughters, whom he divides his kingdom up among his three daughters. And the two whom he thinks love him most end up casting him out, leaving him basically to die uh, without anything. And so this deep loss of your own daughters, basically, after they have your money and your kingdom, they don't care about you. You know, it's really just, your heart bleeds because it's, it's the most unnatural thing, such unthankness, unthankfulness. And so, so this is something that might not have happened, but it's, it's, that you, you'll be moved to, to take more uh, regard for the, people, for the people that brought you to this world, right? the people that, that you owe your life for. Um, and beyond that, um, human sentiments, he says, that even society at large and religion don't deal with, can be dealt with in the theater. So beyond simple emotions, um, well, never simple, as you always know from the plays. Um, he says that there's always, there's always something in us that we don't want to see. And satire and wit is a tool that theater can use for us sitting in the dark someplace in the theater where we can smile and laugh about the small things in ourselves that we can, we can laugh at the 
stupidity or the cowardness of others and recognize it in ourselves because we are not in this in the in the public light we can we can uh, we can accept it there and it improves us as a result um, and a great uh, a great example of that uh, I find one of the most funny is from Henry V, uh, where you have these three men, ancient pistol, Corporal Nim and Bardolf, who are the prime examples of, well, hedonists in any time that are only after getting, up, getting something for themselves. And they're waiting to go to war with Henry, go to war to France, because then they can make money, they can steal things, they can take part in the pillage, you know. But they're a bunch of cowards, and they've got no idea what they're doing. And a young boy uh, reflects on this and uh, is uh, almost made to vomit by thinking about their, their disgusting opportunism of using war to their own advantage on the, on the lowest level. But even beyond that, what theater does, and which getting to an era which Schiller um, really uh, counts on the most is that uh, the inner workings of the human mind and the soul, the motivations that bring us to do things, we can, we can learn from. So he says that, okay, well, that, simply because you see the craziness of Macbeth, right, and his, his inner tornness of being confronted with him ha having killed his king, that might not prevent somebody from murdering. Right? That might not lead someone who sees the play, that doesn't mean that they might not. You know. Schiller says, if you want to be strict, we can't say that we've prevented crime because people go to the theater. But he says, at least we will be strengthened in ourselves, in our mind, and in our emotions, if something like that should, should befall us, should happen. Then we've already had insight to it. It's not totally new, and we can, we can, we can act. Uh, and this is, I mean, the, yeah, all of these, all of the tragedies, uh, Lear, Othello, uh, Macbeth, uh, Hamlet. There's an intense amount of inner dialogue. The people that that are driven to the, these points in, of extremes, and that's the next point that Schiller brings up. That you really give an insight into the motivation. You you can exhaust. Why does somebody get to the point? where they take such an extreme act, such as murder, and it's often murder within their own family, which seems so heinous if you think about it, uh, and you read about it in the newspaper, but you have to, we can't turn away from trying to understand why, how does somebody get to that point? They are not born with that intention. They don't have that intention for most of their life. So what is it that brings them to the point where they subjectively see that they have to do that. And only then are you actually, says Schiller, allowed to judge over this person, once you have taken in the full scope of motivations into account. Um, and then it obviously gets, so you get to a much more simple level that he says that there's something also in theater, and that's which Tom brought up in the beginning, that uh, he says, two things happen which usually don't happen. The rulers of society see something which they usually never see, and that's man, human beings as they are. Usually, and it's still the case today, uh, the elite that runs a country is disconnected from their own country. Um, and they have no insight into into what the needs and uh, wishes are. Um, and on the other hand, uh, truth is also something they, don't, they seldom get. And the stage can be very explicit. Um, 
So this is something that uh, I would like to play for you, which I think is, is, a, is a good example of this kind of insight into human motivation which Shakespeare gives. Um, it's in the booklet that you have, I'm going to play a recording by an actor named Brian Cox, uh, who reads a monologue that King Henry V gives um, before the Battle of Agincourt, which is uh, the decisive battle uh, of King Henry's in France. And Henry has decided to do something which also kings never usually do. He's decided to dress himself up in normal clothing and go into his camp of soldiers and talk to them. How we're, they're badly outnumbered, I think four to one. Uh, there are doubts. The soldiers don't think that King Henry has pure intentions, to put it mildly. They don't see why they should die for him trying to take over the crown of France. And so King Henry decides to go into the camp and, and talk to them and say, well, how can, I, how can I build up their morale? We are outnumbered. And, uh, and so they're all complaining about him. Everybody, every one of the soldiers he talks to, has something bad to say about him. And that leads King Henry to say the following, which I think illustrates Schiller's point the best. It'll also be on the screen here. I should probably make sure that you see. It's not on the booklet? Okay. Okay, oh, that's fine. Well, it's up here then. Upon the king, let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. Robe of golden pearl, the facet title running for the king, 
the throne he sits on, or the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, not all these thrice gorgeous ceremony. Not all these laid in bed majestical can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave, who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest, crammed with distressful bread. Never sees horrid night, the child of hell. But like a lackey from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus and all night. Sleeps in the Elysium next day after dawn. Doth rise and help Hyperion to his horse, and follows so the ever running year with profitable labor to his grave. Is possible to follow that? <coughs> I have had it uh, in the university. I remember that. Oh, yeah? It's one of the most important pieces in the film. Yes. Because uh, he's a good king, he thinks like that. The tired king would never bother. Yes. Uh, it's almost uh, it's almost revolutionary. He's almost calling the citizenry to yeah. feel responsible for their government, right? Yeah. <laughs> he's he's distressed and and stricken by the fact that he feels like he's the only one that has the affairs of state in mind. Yeah. And that none of his followers, all the thousands of people that would kill and cut off people's heads, they don't think about it where it's all going. What is this all about? And he's distressed. He's, he feels the weight. Okay, this is somehow, my, I, have to, I have to bear all of this with me. You know, if I make wrong decisions, the peace does not come. I wouldn't say that Henry V as a play treats King Henry as a, as a good king. I think it's very ambiguous. In, in that sense, but but in that he sense, cares, this is he cares. Yeah, he sees how many ignorant and animals and just beating. That's true. But if you go to the beginning of the scene with the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he's saying, yeah. "Do we have a cause for war?" and the Canterbury says, "Well, yes, you know, according to law, and this person you're connected with, oh well, fine then, you know." And, uh, you know, well, we'll give you uh, all this money so you can go to war and you'll be fine with it. It's not a terribly weighty cause, really, <laughs> you know, to set your country at war with France in that sense. But he's not a, he's not a simple person. He has, and this is the thing which, you have this a lot more with Hamlet, right? this inner dialogue, this doubt. And everybody has that, right? But do we, do we go the full way? Do we come to some conclusion? Do we find, try to find answers as Henry is doing? He's looking for answers in himself, echoing the doubts, echoing what's going on with the kingdom. It's, it's a pretty, I mean, Shakespeare's, it's a pretty clear judgment when he says, <coughs> right, uh, Names all these things which the king is and has, and he's rich and he's powerful and has all these things. But he's every wretched slave, he says, sleeps better than the king. Yeah. 
<laughs> with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest crammed with distressful debt. See, if he has his food and he's got a place to rest, he's fine. He'll sleep more soundly than the king. He doesn't, sure, he'll think about tomorrow and I have to go to the field, I have to, but he's, he's comparing himself, right? And thinking, if you have to think about the whole state, then you don't sleep so well. <laughs> and and he's, he's, it's a very clear judgment. That the citizenry, is obviously not putting themselves in a position where they take up responsibility and they're thinking about, that they're sharing the responsibility and saying, we, we also have an interest to, to have foresight and to think, help out with this. He feels very alone, right? Feels very lonely. And, uh, and he, it's a very, uh, it's also a dangerous thing to say at that time, from Shakespeare's point of view. Yeah? Isn't it that in the time that this was written, but as you mentioned in the beginning, that it was a time of religious war? I mean, there was a... It's coming, coming to war, yeah. Uh, uh, revolution, you can say, against the church in Rome. Mm -hmm. the, the majority of the people of England, they were, they were still Catholics in heart. Sure. They were forced to, to be Protestants. Yeah. And it was yes. a different kind of Protestantism that, that came in Europe because it was dictated by the king. Mm. And so sure. uh, the, the parents of Shakespeare, we know they were Catholics, and we also would imagine that the, mm. the person of Shakespeare himself, he was a Catholic at heart, but he had to balance I don't have a lot of insight into how Shakespeare stood there personally. I know, I know that the, the majority of the people of Stratford were against the whitewashing of their church and were all the paintings and everything were just painted over. They were not for that. Um, it's a very good point though because, because also what's happening here in this monologue is the stripping down of what is the king? Right? What does it mean to be the ruler? Forget everything that you see and that makes up the greatness that you bow down before. What is the essence of this person? What makes him great, right? So he's challenging people. You can judge, you can actually, he's also, it's a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the essence of this person. See, are they, are they doing justice to their office, right? Not un could imagine some people might get nervous, but he was not censored for that. It is, it, I think it's a great challenge you know, for, I, I don't think anybody in London who had been on a stage told, look at your ruler and don't just obey, but think about their qualities. <laughs> that must have been quite a surprise, I think, to people in his time. And I, th I think it just gets, it's one of the best examples of, of, uh, of what, what Schiller writes about. And I have, there's copies of the English essay, but uh, the English translation of the essay, but uh, uh, that, it, that it is, what, what great art does is it allows you to reflect on your own humanity in a way that you don't usually get the chance to have. And to see where's 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 that spark of humanity in me, and where have I lost it? Where is it going? Yeah. And there, are, it's these kind of inner dialogues which I think are, are so precious. Now, of course, uh, Michelle in a second will get to the will get to the meat of that because it's. Uh, it's less the content than it is the form in which, in which it's done. The poetry, the way it's written, the metaphor that's used. You could, you could, we don't have time now to go through this monologue, but you could, this is, this is written in, in the poetic verse. You could write all of that 
in prose, strip it of its metaphor, it would be three or four times as long and a tenth as effective. Sorry, It's a devastating judgment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in that sense, uh, removing all the you know, pomp and ceremony of the king, it opens up. Why am I not taking in that position? Why am I not? Why is there a difference? Mm -hmm. so yeah. Maybe I'm making it too complicated, but that is the talks about poison flattery. <coughs> and they, the way they are not sincere, I don't know. They yes. flatter the king. And this resonance. Really sure. No. Anything. Right. Yes. And that person must be terribly And the audience, this rings with the audience, because if you remember back in Act One, yes. he had to execute send one of his best friends off to execution because he'd been plotting against him and two others who were then really poison flatterers, three, uh, th three uh, noblemen yeah, who he counted as trusted allies and you know, Englishmen, been bought off and they were ready to, to, uh, to kill him before the expedition against France could start. So that rings especially clear, this poison flattery. You don't know because everybody has to respect you, you can't expect real friendship. You can't expect real human relations. And that leads me to my last quote. I'm going to actually ask, uh, I don't know, do we have time for this? <laughs> Schiller ends his essay on theater as a moral institution uh, <coughs> with this quote here, which I'll just read this uh, last part of, because it sort of sums up, I think, quite well <coughs> what we've been starting to discuss, but which I think, if you look and you just let the plays work in you, it's very, so it's just, I mean, in the end, you know, things are, are simpler, they're not that complicated. Um, from the effect that they have and this, this ability to, to take part in, in, another, in another person's destiny in, in the woes and challenges that other people go through and therefore um, you come out more experienced. But he boils it down to this, uh, to this statement here where he says, uh, after having gone through all of these uh, reasons why, uh, why the theater as an institution should be given this essential stage in society, he says, and then at last, oh nature, what a triumph for you. Nature so frequently trodden to the ground, so frequently risen from its ashes, when man at last in all districts and reason, <coughs> regions and classes with all his chains of fad and fashion cast away, and every bond of destiny rent asunder, when man becomes his brother's brother with a single all-embracing sympathy, resolved once again into a single species, forgetting himself and the world, and reapproaching his own heavenly origin, each takes joy in others' delights, which then, magnified in beauty and strength, are reflected back to him from a hundred eyes, and now his bosom has room for a single sentiment, and this is to be truly human. Make me think of the uh, uh, Ninth Symphony of George 
Shakespeare's plays really do have. And the point is to have it performed. You can't, reading it, reading it as if you're hearing it is difficult. And actually, uh, Shakespeare uses in one of his sonnets to, to see, to hear with your eyes is an art. There's some way like that in the song. So it's very difficult to read the plays as if they're being performed and have the same effect, right? But they, they are not meant to be read, actually. And that's something we should always remember when we think, oh, I hated reading him in class. Well, there's a reason for that, you know. And uh, if you read a play and you hear it, it suddenly makes much more sense, even if uh, you don't understand more of some of the old words or some of the metaphors. Simply the fact that an actor who does know what it means is saying it to you has, carries a lot of the meaning. Um, but uh, to end um, this uh, this improvement of the audience through through the the beauty of the play is uh is obviously obviously uh, the center of um, I think Shakespeare's whole life. I think most of the sonnets, if you read them, uh, he's talking about his love all the time, and a lot of the time you can't say it's just a person, and that it's something. It's ambiguous. It, uh, often it's very clear it's his art, which is his love. Um, and he's throughout the sonnets he's, and I think Michelle will get a bit of this he's dealing with what is it that survives after we die what is it that I am going to what is it in this beauty or these great things that, are, that whether it's a person or these great things that I produce how will they survive how will they how they, will they endure over time and it's very clear that he's that he means that it will be in the mind and in the heart of each successive generation. That that's the way that's the way it survived, and that he very yeah, in a most powerful way, is able to transport this idea, and he he is doing it f with his th theaters, with his theater plays. And most explicitly in the prologue of Henry V, of which I wanted to play um, a reading also. Because there he's very explicit about what this is about. And this is very good to read and hear on the background of what I said at the beginning. Like how do we do, deal with the fact that we are in a cultural dark age, that people's imagination is stunted, that you go from the Lord of the Rings to the Hobbit to the next 3D high frame rate movie picture and great huge cinemas. Obviously, you know, theater is nothing compared to that. Theater cannot compete with, with all the great effects that mass modern culture can produce. But what is it that <laughs> great art has that these things don't have. And was it, what is it about so what is it about the mind which uh, which is looking for something new and that's, that's why I think that it's very clear that this, this sensual this, look, this search for sensual uh, experience for some kind of new visual audio impact as cinema is and which most of, most of the people are running after, you always need a new one every, every week, every month. This huge film industry, this huge media industry has to keep 
putting out something new because it isn't really new. It's just a little different. But you need something else to keep it alive. On the other hand, you can read a Shakespeare play a hundred times and still get something new out of it because the things that are transported with ideas cannot be taken away from you. And that's the difference. How many people would become depressed if all the cinemas were shut down tomorrow? How many people wouldn't know what to do with themselves if all the uh, rock bands would start, start putting out a new, a new album the next, next week? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not advocating that. I'm just, you know, I think. Uh, I think that uh, that a combination of this kind of cultural dark age uh, combined with an inability to to portray what it is that people and kids, especially, are missing with this stuff, uh, is the reason why it's not living in people's minds and it's become a dead thing of the past which it shouldn't be. And Shakespeare gives, throws the challenge out to his audience in this way back then. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or maybe cram within this wooden o the very cast that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us ciphers to this greater comp on your imaginary forces of work. <coughs> Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high upreared and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts into a thousand parts, divide one man, and make imaginary cuisance. Think, when we talk of horses, that you see them printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth, for tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping o'er times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me, chorus, like your humble patience pray gently to hear kindly to judge our play basically saying how how can you even imagine what I'm trying to tell you and that just colored in this slide here all of these Illusions to what he's talking about. The muse of fire, the heaven of invention, the port of Mars. Uh, things in red here. This wooden O is obviously the stage. And then in green, uh, all of the references to the mind, your imaginary forces. Peace out our, imp your, our imperfections with your thoughts. Think, for it is your thoughts that now must deck our kings. Also, because they didn't have a lot of references from the stage, they couldn't have horses on the stage. Uh, they didn't have much. Therefore, the, the, the audience must use that imagination. True. Yeah, and, and that's the advantage. The that's the good thing. Mm -hmm. That's the good thing about it. When we see a play on television, that's the last thing we see. Yeah. They didn't have it. Well, but you know the difference when you read a book yeah, and then you see the movie idea. of the book yeah. and you're kind of like, hmm, I had a different idea about that. Yeah? yeah? You ever had that? You read a book and then you see the movie and say, like, hmm, <coughs> I had a totally different world in my mind. Right? And that's just, 
if you have that from the beginning, then you don't have a chance to have that. Right? That's why we have this wonderful description. Yeah. Shakespeare makes. Right. Because That's exactly you can't the point. I'm not. I'm not convinced that Shakespeare would go to to Pixar Studios and Walt Disney Pictures and yeah. have them create movie pictures of his pieces, because he he's a poet. He's he's a He's a man of ideas, and that's primary for him. And for him, it's not primary the horses, but that you imagine them yeah. has a bigger effect. If you sit, uh, if you are sitting around the scene, I can hear you say what precious is this is very into the scene. Sure. But the people are all around. Mm -hmm. But if you don't pay respect to the to the imagination of your audience, yeah. you can go to the insane extremes. I mean, Richard Strauss at the end of the uh, uh, 20th century, beginning of the uh, beginning of the 20th century, had uh, one of his operas performed where he insisted on having live animals on stage. And the director was, uh, the conductor was uh, fighting with him about it because they were afraid that the animals, when all the <laughs> instruments got going, would jump in and kill the musicians or go crazy. Uh, and he wanted to have, you know, the the sheeps uh, sacrificed on stage, and they actually uh, did have blood on stage, and they did it as real as possible. But it was then, but th that that's the point, that these things, they clasp the mind to that sensory impression, and then the freedom of the mind's gone. Because you've forced the picture on the audience. And so you've taken away their ability to, to come up with it themselves, and therefore the the essence of it is lost. Um, so I'll... F Daniel? Yeah. Isn't that reminder of what Rouge often said, talks about that nothing manifests, nothing physically, no physical manifestation can completely uh, describe or be the idea behind it. Sure. Sure. Michelle's going to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I... I uh, I have run out of time. I will probably live some years longer, but my <laughs> what I mean is my presentation uh, needs to be wrapped up. Um, so, uh, just a couple of examples of um, the effects that uh, this has had. This is a quote from Kennedy, which. Uh, We've used our friends from the Schiller Institute in the United States have used a lot. There's a DVD you can get there of a JFK celebration we've held. This is at the opening of a, of a library in honor of the poet Robert Frost, uh, who died just a year before that speech. And uh, that speech itself is just uh, a few weeks before his own death. Um, because it is the case, as Tom was saying, that people do learn from history, do learn from poetry for their own actions. Uh, and if someone is a great leader, then they do pay attention to the poets because they, they can find a way and access to something, uh, to something deeper beyond that which they're confronted with on a day-to-day -day basis and therefore uh, make, uh, make better decisions. And I find this great is uh, when power narrows the areas of man's concern, poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of his existence. Uh, also, Lincoln was a great uh, fan of Shakespeare. He, uh, in fact, had was reciting Macbeth to people on a, on a steamboat ride. Um, he had a an exchange, letter exchange with um, with an actor, uh, with whom he said that the greatest part of Hamlet is not the soliloquy to be or not to be, but it's the monologue of um, of uh, Hamlet's uncle, the new king, uh, when he says, "Oh, my offense is rank," Claudi Claudius the king, where he reflects on all the death and chaos that is happening around him because he killed his brother. And, uh, and also, in another case, 
Uh, so Lincoln uh, picked out this quote sim because it is this reflection on uh, the guilt of the evildoer that the, that the evildoer has does actually reflect on their own guilt and is has access to that they've done something wrong and this is a reflection I think of also of Lincoln's obvious obviously uh, immortal belief in the good in man but also that he especially enjoyed this aspect that Shakespeare picked out uh, or used in these monologues that that uh, there is an ability for people to reflect on on what they've done and and expose themselves and and uh, it's not the case that people just do bad things and then go about their lives. Um, I uh, just at the end want to recommend three books if if you don't know how to get into in having a vivid dive into Shakespeare. Um, this is a very good biography, 1599 by James Shapiro. And it's the year in which King Henry V and also Hamlet, amongst others, was written. It's a very productive year, uh, breakthrough in his, in his writing. Um, a great fun one for people who think they can't understand or think that Shakespeare is terrible is Shakespeare on Toast by Ben Crystal, who's a young English actor whose father has done a lot of work digging up the original pronunciation of from Shakespeare's time, which gives insight into a lot of the rhymes and jokes that are lost on modern day audiences. Um, it's really great to, uh, to uh, dive into the whole world of, of uh, Shakespeare's activity. And then there's this, this last one, which is, these are all relatively new, and then there's uh, from last year, Shakespeare Saved My Life by Laura Bates. Who um, teaches uh, English literature in, in Illinois, and started doing Shakespeare classes in um, prisons, in high security prisons, the worst type of criminal. And so, uh, what Schiller wrote and what Lessing and Shakespeare were talking about has actually been vindicated. Shakespeare has, and <coughs> classical poetry has saved lives. Um, it's an amazing book to read. If you start it, you won't put it down. And it really shows you how much more could be done today if we really paid attention to um, bringing classical art back to life, making it real, that it's not something from the past that we enjoy because we're trying to pass the time, but it's, it actually really does affect the human soul. And it's, it's a great testament to that. Um, so that's that's what I'd have to say about that for now. Um, there's a lot more that could be said. But.